Coming up, go into the mind of a terrorist from a man who used to be one. And then, nobody was looking for me. Her parents sold her for drugs. He said that I was his personal slave. I felt violated. I felt used. Dirty. Her escape. I'm not ever coming back here. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. This weekend, the city of Dallas honored its fallen police officers who died in the bloody shooting rampage last weekend. And now some church leaders like Bishop T.D. Jakes are working to bring healing to their shaken city. President Obama and former President Bush will appear at an interfaith memorial in Dallas tomorrow to pay tribute to the officers who were murdered. Ephraim Graham brings us this story from Dallas. The memorial here outside the Dallas police precinct grows with each passing day. More flowers, more notes, more teddy bears, and more people traveling from far and near to see officers say thank you and send up a prayer. Uh, peace. Just peace. You would have thought we'd be doing this, we'd be doing this for years 2016. That's all I want is peace. The city saw chaos Thursday following a rally and peaceful protest. And it was while we were dispersing that the gunfire began. Pastor Michael Waters was at the protest calling for an end to police brutality after the deaths of Alton Sterling in Louisiana and Philando Castile in Minnesota. It was white people, it was Latino people, it was Asian people, it was young people. There were children in that crowd. But everyone there in that non-violent, peaceful rally and march were there because they love life and they want to preserve it. And it has broken all of our hearts their life was taken that night. Police say gunman Micah Johnson claimed he was angry about the deaths the protesters were marching against. That's why he took aim at white officers, killing five and injuring seven. You would still hear the gunfire, and it was a shock because you went from total peace and tranquility to total chaos at a moment. The sniper attack on 12 Dallas police officers reminded many of another dark day in the city's history, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy here in Dealey Plaza in 1963, just blocks from where the gunman took aim at the officers, delivering the painful blow to the city and to the country. I will remain The pain gave way to praise here at the Potter's House Church. Many of you recognize, in fact, all of you must recognize that we've had a very challenging week in our city, been tested to our very core, shaken to our very foundation. Where Bishop T.D. Jakes canceled his regular Sunday sermon and hosted a town hall. At the table, the city's mayor. You don't demonize people. You say, hey, I think you got it wrong here. Okay? Mm -hmm. But God loves you, and I'm going to lift you up. Mm -hmm. Okay? An officer who watched a colleague die in the tragedy, shot in the face. Sometimes you, you dream that this person's sitting next to your bed or standing next to your bed asking you why. And those are the hard times. A protester who was for a time falsely accused of being the shooter. It was first a moment of disbelief. I thought they were joking until they started sending me the images to the phone and the family of the man shot and killed in Louisiana last week. But when I saw the second tape, he suffered. Sandra Sterling recalled her final moments with Alton, visiting the graves of family members just two days before he died. And we went to his brother's grave, his brother, his mother, my father, and his dad. And we visited each one of those graves. And that's the last time, last time I saw him and heard from him. That pain, the city's pain, and the country's pain is why Bishop Jakes called for the day's conversation. Injustices, police killings, domestic violence, black on black crime. Oh, we got a lot of stuff to pray about. 
we're going to make it. And there are hopeful signs just outside police headquarters. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Dallas, Texas. Thanks, Ephraim. A little personal remembrance. Years and years ago, but I, I came down here in Portsmouth, Virginia, about 1959 and about 1960. Um, there was a riot of sorts in the mid-city section of Portsmouth, and I went with a friend, Dick Simmons, down there to see if we couldn't do something to help people. And uh, we gathered around us a group of black teenagers, and I said, if you want to find the Lord, let's kneel down, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And these people very reverently knelt all around. We were on a sidewalk. Uh, and uh, we were kneeling in prayer. <clears throat> and as I was praying, I heard the crunch of tires uh, of a vehicle coming up close to us. Mm -hmm. And the next thing we know, we were being charged by police with dogs, big, burly policemen with nasty, snarling dogs. And the dogs had their mouth out, and they charged into us. All we were doing was praying. and. Uh, of course, from that moment on, these kids dispersed. They ran across the street to the uh, tenement where they lived and began throwing rocks back at the police. And all of a sudden, uh, we had an incident where before we were having a peaceful prayer meeting. Uh, I got a feeling of what some of these folks have to go through. And uh, it hasn't been pleasant. It certainly uh, hasn't been in the South and uh, I guess in the North as well. But the truth is, because some bad uh, apples in the police force uh, shoot somebody, one to two, it doesn't justify somebody a thousand miles away from taking a gun and shooting six police officers to death. That isn't right. We must, must defend the police. The police are there to protect and to serve. And the vast, vast majority are doing everything they can to put their lives on the line so that you and I can be safe in our homes from violence and from crime. And this, this I think, is an aberration. What I'm concerned about is the professional agitators who come running into these scenes uh, and, and start calling on Black Lives Matter or, and don't shoot hands up and all that. Uh, to make a hero out of a guy who was uh, high on drugs and breaking the law and trying to steal a police uh, officer's weapon away from him, uh, that, that isn't the kind of hero that the black people need to look for. So together as Americans, we can overcome this, but we, we must realize that there has been a, a, a serious problem. But now the problem isn't near as bad as it has been. And I think what we need to do is come together as Americans and love each other. And uh, we can do it. There's no question about it. But I've seen it when I was kneeling on the sidewalk in a troubled area with young black teenagers kneeling in prayer, calling on Jesus. I realized I had the answer, and I still do, because the answer is in Jesus Christ. Well, Americans are still taking to the streets to protest the police shooting in Louisiana and Minnesota. John Jessup has that story. That's right, Pat. The weekend brought more protests as investigations are beginning into both of those shootings. And there's a story emerging of a mom who literally shielded her son from bullets in Dallas, while the police in turn protected both mother and child. Dale Hurd has a story. It was a weekend of angry protest. And arrest. <laughs> Racial tensions at the breaking point after Dallas Army vet Micah Johnson used his military training to shoot and kill five Dallas police officers at a Black Lives Matter protest over the shooting of black men in Baton Rouge in Minnesota. And the Dallas police chief says he planned an even deadlier attack, possibly using explosives. More than 160 people are believed to have been arrested during the weekend protest in Baton Rouge alone. At least 30 of those arrests Sunday night as a few hundred people tried to block roads. There have been demonstrations throughout the country. Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson called for dialogue. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety in this country right now, but at a moment like this, we need to take the opportunity to come together, uh, develop community relations across the country. Speaking to the Spanish media Sunday, President Obama commented on some of the rhetoric at Black Lives Matter demonstrations. In a movement like Black Lives Matter, 
there's always going to be some folks who say things that uh, are, are stupid. And, and I don't think that you can hold well-meaning activists who are doing the right thing and peacefully protesting responsible for everything that is uttered at a protest. And on social media, some are pushing the theme that President Obama has justified the violence against police, although the president has also offered his support for officers as well. And this Dallas mother, being called a hero for shielding her son from the hail of bullets in the Dallas shooting and getting hit in the leg, was thanking police for protecting her family. So thankful. I had never seen anything like that. The way they just came around us and just guarded us like that. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. In other news, with just a week to go before the Republican convention, more speculation over who presumptive nominee Donald Trump will pick as his running mate. Indiana Governor Mike Pence reportedly is very high on the list, with The Washington Times reporting that several sources close to the Trump campaign, along with politicians in Indiana, believe there's an extremely high chance Pence is his pick. Trump is reportedly considering others, including retired Army General Michael Flynn. But Flynn parts ways with Trump on the issue of abortion, telling ABC News that women have to have the right of choice. Pat will be interviewing Donald Trump on a range of issues, and you can see that exclusive interview on tomorrow's 700 Club. Pat? Well, uh, Mr. Trump's going to be here in Tidewater at uh, the city center in Norfolk. I think there's a closed meeting. He's talking about defense issues, and I will be talking to him after that. And then we will be bringing you that exclusive interview tomorrow on this show. Wendy? So maybe we'll know more about who he's going to select for well, He vice told me president. the last time what he wanted, and he was the general, so we'll see. Okay, that's going to be exciting. Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, coming up, a former Muslim sniper takes us inside the mind of a terrorist. Find out what motivates ISIS and other extremist groups and how to stop them. Hey, you're watching the 700 Club. We've got some great things for you today, so stay tuned. The most recent attacks in Brussels, Orlando, and Istanbul have Islamic extremists written all over them. But what's behind these brutal and bloody terrorist strikes? We're going to speak with a former insider who may have the answers. Take a look. Tassada is a Palestinian born in Gaza. He joined the Fatah movement when he was just 17 because he says Yasser Arafat was his hero. Sada believed the Jews had stolen Palestinian land and so he was determined to help push Israel into the sea. He became a sniper picking off Israeli soldiers. His nickname was Butcher. But his most prestigious job back then was as personal driver for Arafat. In the 1970s, though, Sada left all that behind and started a new life here in the United States, where this Muslim with ties to terrorism heard the gospel for the very first time and turned his life over to Jesus Christ. Sada says his Christian faith and his experiences with Islamic extremism have left him uniquely qualified to explain what motivates ISIS and other terrorist groups and how best to respond to them. He writes about it in a new book. The mind of terror. Well, it's nice to hear from one somebody's been there. Tess Sada joins us now. We welcome into the 700 Club. So good to see you. Thank nice you for being with so us. So good to be with you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. We were just talking. You you you've gone on some kind of a diet. You're half the man you used to be. What <laughs> happened? I am. I decided I, I had some health problems that I needed to lose. Yeah. Some weight, so I cut down half of my weight, basically, well, 180 you, pounds. You, you have a formula. You can sell it if you want to. <laughs> well, you were born in Gaza. You were a Palestinian, and somehow you were fascinated with Yasser Arafat. You worshipped him. What happened? He was my hero, it's literally. But Jesus came to my in the picture, and he became my hero. Amen. Jesus well, is. You know, I've interviewed Arafat uh, at least three times or more. Uh, I met him in Gaza. I met him uh, in Jerusalem and other places. I mean, in Bethlehem, and. Uh, uh, he was a stone cold killer. Uh, he, you know, he really was. I mean, he didn't hesitate to shoot people. I mean, was that the kind of hero you wanted? 
Well, at the time, of course, because of what I believed, and, mm -hmm. and I believed uh, I had the right to my homeland, and that's mm -hmm. what I was fighting for. And uh, at the time, you know, didn't know exactly what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, in the mind, in the mind, in my mind at the time, as like anybody who was angry and violent at the time, for me, I was in the right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, they say the, the, mo the craziest person and most psychic person in the world is always believing that he's doing he's right. right. Well, you were yeah. a sniper. You actually shot Israeli soldiers, right? Sadly, I say so. Yes. Yeah. I was an assassin. An uh, assassin? Yes. Uh, well, where did you think you were going to go? Where did the people around you think that this was going to result in end? We believed we had the cause. Mm -hmm. We believed in, in the cause of our homeland, having homeland. See, I grew up in Saudi Arabia since mm -hmm. I was two months old. My family immigrated to Saudi Arabia from Gaza. And uh, I, I was called a Palestinian immigrant and a refugee all the time. And I hated that. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be an immigrant and a refugee. So when we lost the war of 1967, I decided that's it. These Arab leaders are wicked and selling us out to the Jews. We're going to go fight for it. And so that's why I joined Yasser Arafat. Well, Arafat, the PLO, was a, a creature of the Muslim Brotherhood out of Egypt. Did you think of any of that, or you just thought this is the cause for Palestine? Well, at the time, we really did not have an Islamic cause. Mm -hmm. I, I did not. I didn't think Arafat did either. Most of us all were secular. Mm. We just fought, fought for a homeland, basically. Well, the terrorists today, are they different from what you were? Today, they are totally different. They are, they are fighting for the cause of Allah. Mm -hmm. Or they at least they are, they are training their people and brainwashing their people to believe that's the right cause and that's the right fight. Today, what do you think is going to change all this? Is there anything that you see other than a divine intervention that's going to make it happen? Other than a divine intervention, there is not going to be. Other than us, the followers of Jesus, loving them mm -hmm. and pray for those who persecute us. That's the only way we're going to make a difference. Have you studied this ISIS, this uh, uh, Zerkawi and the others who are, uh, have led that uh, group? It's, it's kind of strange, this caliphate. Uh, they, he is very, very learned person. He is very highly educated and, and very smart. And he is using that intelligence mm -hmm. to lure down <coughs> young Muslims that are troubled, that have a background that, that uh, is being hurt somehow. And so it, it is, they, he's using that. Mm -hmm. He's using the media very, very wisely. What would you think America ought to do to stop that? Just love them or do something different? Uh, we have to be careful. You know, I, I'm an immigrant and I was given the opportunity for the American dream. You know, Pat, I, I hated America and Americans and what mm -hmm. it stood for before I came to America. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why I was so drawn to come to America. I was drawn. Mm -hmm. And I came. And you know, not too long after I was here, um, a couple of months later, I realized the American people are good people. <laughs> they accepted me. They yeah. did not call me an immigrant and refugee like I was in, in Saudi so, Arabia yeah. and in Qatar. So I decided I want to make a life in this country. Well, you've done a good job. This book is called The Might of Terror. Well, why did you write it, by the way? You just wanted to tell people the, the situation they didn't understand? This book came out of the fact that I was so tired of seeing that terrorism because mm -hmm. I was taken part of that in my life, in my past life. And I wanted to help the American people and Europeans how they can deal with this terrorism. Mm -hmm. The only answer for that is Jesus. There is no other answer. Mm -hmm. There is no other answer.
I believed in a homeland mm -hmm. that is Palestine. But now I do believe in a land that God called Israel. Mm -hmm. And I stand for Israel. Mm -hmm. I stand for Israel's right to exist. But also I do believe in the Palestinian people right to exist in the same land, not under as Sharon suggests, or mm -hmm. Arafat suggested to Sharon one time, Israel Stein. No, Israel. It is one nation for both people to live in peace. Do you think that dream will be realized? I am living that dream. Mm -hmm. I'm living, I live in Jericho. Yeah. I live in Jericho most of my life. I mean, most of the time. I live 70% of the year I live in Jericho. And unable to stay there and, and able to make a difference. I believe, Pastor, if we raise a new generation with a new hope and a different mind, we can make a difference. Well, I hope you're right. The book, ladies and gentlemen, is called The Mind of Terror, and it's available wherever books are sold. Tas Sada, we're just so glad you're here and continue the good work. God bless you. Bless you too, Thank sir. You very Thank much. you so Thank much. You. Thank you for having me. Wendy? Fascinating. Thanks, Pat. Well, up next, a story of almost unspeakable abuse. At the age of 14, this woman was sold by her parents and kept for eight years as a sex slave. I didn't see another person because he kept me locked in a room. I felt like a slave. I did. He sexually abused me. He used to tell me he could kill me, and nobody would know. Nobody was looking for me. Stay tuned to see how she escaped after this. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. I'm going to tell you an unimaginable story. It couldn't happen. Could it? parent actually sell her own child? Well, that's exactly what happened to 14-year-old Felicia Tucker, and not in some third world country, right here in the old U.S. of A. Felicia Tucker's mother and stepfather were addicted to drugs. When she was 14, her parents' drug supplier started showing interest in her. He was 16 years older. When he would come over to get his money or whatever, he'd sit there and talk and chat a little bit. But he would always tell me um, that I was beautiful. I remember he kissed me. And I felt awkward because I'm like, this is a grown man. He's old enough to be my father. And then he started buying me stuff. I was like, wow. I felt like, man, he, he must really like me. He took me to his apartment one time. And he said, I, I want you to do something for me. He outright raped me. He um, said, now, you know, you've been teasing me, and now it's time to pay up. I felt violated. I felt used. I felt dirty. That same year, Felicia's parents were arrested and sent to jail. The supplier paid the bail and demanded a trade to clear their debt. So they made a deal, I guess, with each other. He said he, he would get his money right or whatever, and he said, well, Felicia stays with me. Felicia had to drop out of school in seventh grade and lived in isolation, enduring every type of abuse. For years, sometimes I didn't see another person because he kept me locked in the room. I felt like a slave, I did. He would sexually abuse me. He would call me out when he was ready for me. He said that I was his personal slave, I can, do, I can do with you, I can kill you. He went from calling me beautiful to ugly. He beat me several times, I was close to death. During this time, Felicia's mom and stepfather made no effort to bring her home. He used to tell me he could kill me and nobody would know because he could bury me on the, at the bottom of the hill of that land. Nobody would know because nobody's looking for you. Nobody's looking for me. Felicia felt the only solution was to end her life. I looked in his cabinet and I got some pills out and I took almost the whole bottle and I said, well, it's gonna be over now because I don't wanna be here. I can't, I can't go home. You know, I'm stuck. I don't wanna be here. I hate it here. And I laid there and I, 
closed my eyes and I thought it was gonna be the end of it. And I woke up and I was mad that I woke up. Felicia lived in mental and physical captivity almost eight years. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I missed out on so much. When she was 22 years old, she finally resolved to run away. Her chance came when her captor forgot to lock her bedroom door one day. He used to always tell me that he was gonna kill me if I left. I had tried one time before to, to leave, like years before, and when, I, when he drug me back, I said if he locks this door, you know, my bedroom door, I was gonna go out the window or anything. I was getting out of there that day. And I opened the door and I looked around at the living room, looked at where I had been for all those years, and I said, yeah, this is where I have been, but this is not my home. I'm not ever coming back here. Felicia fled 12 miles down the road on foot. I have not seen him. That was 19, October 1997. I have never seen him again. Felicia had no education, life skills, or family to live with. So the next day, she walked into the Army National Guard office and signed up. She kept her past hidden and thrived in a new environment. She later joined the Army and met her husband on assignment in 1999. Together, they had twin girls. After serving four years, Felicia left the military and the trauma and abuse from her past began to seep into her marriage. After a divorce in 2005, she found herself a single mother struggling to make ends meet. When she fell behind on her daycare payment, a church worker offered her a glimmer of hope. She said, your girls go to the daycare here at the church. Why don't you all come to church this Sunday? She said, and I want you to know that as long as, as, long as you show effort, your girls will have a place to stay, you know, a daycare. And, and I was just looking at her like, Wow, she's showing me mercy. It made me feel love. I remember the pastor preaching. He said, if there's anybody in here that, has, that hasn't made uh, Jesus their, their Lord and Savior. And my heart just started beating real fast, I mean like in my throat. And I walked to the altar and I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus Christ that day. I just felt, I don't know, I just felt like the weight of the world was off my shoulders. I, I felt so light. I felt like dancing. I mean, I really, I could have did flips the way I was feeling inside. Before I was in bondage, physically, spiritually, I didn't know who God was. But when I felt the love of God, it's like that ball just started unraveling and I could start living again. Today, she is happily remarried, has a great job, and both of her daughters love God. Felicia says her new faith not only changed the course of her future, but it even changed her perspective on the past. He freed me from that bondage or feeling like I owe somebody. And he also freed me of that hurt. I forgive that man. I forgive him. I do. I pray he gets saved. I mean, I never thought I would be living the life I live today. You know what I mean? I belong to him. And I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. He says that I'm beautiful. He says that he loves me unconditionally, and I am the apple of his eye. Bondage, bondage. You know, you may not be a physical slave, but chances are you're in bondage to something. You're in bondage to the past. You're in bondage to some kind of drug. You're in bondage to alcohol, to tobacco, for your own hatred and bitterness. There's a lot of bondage. Felicia was in the most excruciating kind of bondage you could imagine. Just imagine being sold and being locked in a room and nothing to do. It's amazing that she wasn't scarred for life, but somehow the Lord took what was meant for evil and turned it into something good. Now, <clears throat> Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. That's what the Bible says, and it says it several times. It's very clear. He came to set the captive free. Now, if you are in bondage, whatever the bondage may be, whatever has held you down, kept you from reaching your full potential, whatever that bondage is, the Lord has set you free. He died to break the bonds to set you free. And if you want freedom today, Whatever it is, you may be an actual bondage. You may be an actual slave. But so many people are enslaved to the other things that I mentioned. And if you want to be free from that bondage, I want you to pray with me right now. Don't be afraid. Just bow your head and watch what God will do in your life. All right? You want to be free? Call upon the name of the Lord. 
Do it now. Jesus, that's right. Pray with me. Jesus, you know about bondage. You know about slavery. And I come to you now, Lord, and I confess that I have been a slave to sin. I've been a slave to things that were not pure. I've been a slave, Lord, to things that have not been of God. But right now, Lord, I renounce Satan. I renounce sin. I renounce the evil of this world. And I confess that you died to set me free. And so I come to you now, Lord, confessing my sins and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that you would come and deliver me. And from this moment on, Lord Jesus, I am yours. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. And thank you for life. Wherever you are, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to go to your phones and I want you to call in and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And I want to send you a little packet that will tell you it's called The New Day. And I'll send it to you free. It'll just help you start. But whatever you've done, you've got a new life ahead of you. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? Thanks, Pat. Well, coming up, Pat returns to the hot seat for another round of Bring It On. Bonnie writes, my pastor says that I am not truly baptized unless I've been totally immersed as an adult. I was confirmed, joined the church, received the Holy Spirit, and speak in tongues. Is this all worthless since I wasn't immersed? Pat tackles this question and more still ahead. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Al Qaeda's media arm has released an audio in which the purported son of Osama bin Laden threatens revenge against the U.S. for assassinating his father. In it, Hamza bin Laden tells Americans that they are accountable for the decisions of their leaders. He also says Al Qaeda will continue waging jihad against the U.S. in response to its, quote, oppression of Muslims. Well, kids in Hong Kong are becoming better students thanks to CBN Superbook. This past spring and summer, the University of Hong Kong's Education Department helped young students who were struggling in school. The teaching started in small groups of 13 students using Superbook family discussion guides from the Superbook DVDs. Since then, students have seen improvement in their lessons and self-confidence. The university plans on continuing the program to help many more children with a Superbook ministry. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Wendy will be back right after this. Well, you can be among the first to watch the latest episodes of Superbook by joining the Superbook DVD Club. The cost is just $25, and your credit or debit card will be charged whenever we release a new episode. We'll send you three copies, one to keep and two to share with family and friends. Plus, if you join now during our summer of adventure, we'll send you the Explore 2-pack. It contains four episodes, music video, videos, and even a lesson on how to draw Superbook characters. Just dial the number on your screen. There it is, 1-800-759-0700, or log on to cbn.com. I like that summer of adventure. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, it's the summer of something. Well, you did surfing adventure and with me. Yeah, I just got to surf three days in Florida. I surfed for the first time on the West Coast last week. You're going to be a pro. You'll be a teacher before you finish. Listen, I don't know about that. I just know that it's a lot of fun. It, it's it's a Addictive, like you know, when you get up on the. I never thought I could do it, but you know, those couple seconds that you're up there on the board, it's a kind of. We fun. interviewed that nice young girl that only had one arm, you know, and she was a surfing champion. And the way she, her Bethany body. Bethany Hamilton, was yeah. Unbelievable. I know okay. she's amazing. Well, today, Tom and B. J. Anderson are enjoying a comfortable retirement. Looking back, they could remember some tough financial times. They also remember how Tom's income tripled and then quadrupled after they found the solution to all their money problems. Watch this. Dr. Tom Anderson is proud of his 29 years in the U.S. Army. He joined in 1969 
and served in Vietnam as a chopper pilot. When he got back to the States, he chose a new direction for his life. I decided I wanted to change my life, and so I applied for medical school, and I went to medical school in the military. Tom got accepted, and the Army agreed to pay his tuition. But to finish, he had to go off active duty and go to school full time, which meant giving up a steady paycheck. What we did pick up was a $400 stipend that we received. And so that's all the money we had for Tom and I and our two kids who were toddlers at that time. And I took a job while he was at med school um, at a um, fast food restaurant that did fried chicken. Uh, so that I could take home the leftovers because they did not reheat or reserve those things, which is a good thing to know. And um, we would have fried chicken for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it was free. At the end of the month, if there was $5 left, then we would give one or two dollars to the church. In the late 80s, they found a new church where they learned about the blessings that come when you give to God first. BJ and I sat down one day and said, we have to change what we're doing because we're not tithing and we're not giving any offerings. And um, so we decided to change the way we paid our bills. We decided what we were going to give and we decided to do that first. And so that was the first check we wrote every month was to the church. Tom and BJ say once they began tithing consistently, their finances began to improve. Just a few months after they decided to tithe, Tom was given an opportunity to train as a radiologist. Now. I was a full colonel in rank at that time. And usually those jobs go to the younger uh, rank uh, captains and uh, maybe majors, but not to a full colonel. And so I was blessed to get that position. And I know that God had his hand in that whole operation because that just doesn't happen. As a radiologist, his income tripled. And over the years, they started giving more. In 2000, Tom retired from the military and went into private practice. When I retired from the military, I got a couple jobs where my, my salary was quadrupled. And that was, all, that was all because of my trusting God. And so it just kept on happening. I, as we gave more, more came in. And we found out after a while, we just couldn't outgive God. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> it's amazing. They also started giving to CBN and are now members of the Founders Club. I like the 700 Club TV show. I really like that show. Um, you have a combination of praying for people, you have news, and I get to learn things about uh, Christians in different countries and what they're going through. So I love that program. Today, they're both retired and still believe that blessings come when we give and trust God. I can tell you that when you take that step to trust God, you are going to be unbelievably surprised. It's a miracle. It's just, it's just happened year after year after year in my life. And I can tell you that it's happened to me, and it can happen to you. Like it, it happened to me, and it can happen to you. Isn't that amazing? Triple, then quadruple his income. What's the secret? Well, you don't give to get, but it's one of those laws. If it wasn't in there, the Lord wouldn't have told you to do it. He says, given, it'll be given unto you. It's in the Bible. And so it's not an unwholesome thing to expect a blessing when you bless somebody else. So. What I want you to do is join the 700 Club. That's 65 cents a day, and you'll be blessing people all around the world. And I want to send you victory for life storms. I think it'll be a blessing to you. I'll tell you what's coming up. They had me read, read from John, the entire book of John. And uh, it's going to have some musical score to it. And we'll have that out in a little while. And for those who join the 700 Club, not quite yet, but it'll be available soon. But in the meantime, we have something called Power for Life. And there are teachings that we send out every week, I mean, excuse, every month, um, from those who join Pledge Express. So if you tell your financial institution, your bank or whatever, to just make an automatic withdrawal uh, every month, then we'll send this an additional gift because it helps save money for us and it helps bless you. So. Wendy. Sounds great. <laughs> the surfer, the surfing queen, the queen of Malibu, who just returned from conquering Malibu and, and the Gulf Coast. Yeah, right. It is so beautiful out there. Yeah, it really, it really is yeah. close to paradise. Well, anyway, up next, we'll bring it on. Sue says churches and religious organizations are tax exempt, yet Jesus clearly said, render unto Caesar 
Just because something is allowed, does it make it right? Stay tuned for Pat's answer after this. Welcome back. It's time for your questions and Pat's in the hot seat. Bonnie says, my pastor says that even though I was baptized as a child and I remember it, I am not truly baptized unless I've been totally immersed as an adult. He also said the creed I've recited for years isn't in the Bible and doesn't count. I was confirmed, joined the church, received the charismatic baptism in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Is this all worthless since I was not immersed? Please help me. You know, I have a uh, theological school in my university, the, my university, university I'm head of, and uh, we're training pastors in the Bible. And it just appalls me how many uh, pastors are mistaught about the Bible, about Christian doctrine and so forth. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about you've got to be immersed. It does talk about dying with him, buried in baptism, and raised in newness of life. But nevertheless, uh, the Apostle Paul said, look, I didn't baptize anybody, except, oh, yeah, there were two or three, and he remembered, yeah, the Christmas and Gaius and so forth. But um, uh, he said, the, God, the Lord didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's the preaching of the gospel. Now, look, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've spoken in tongues. You have uh, been entering into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Enjoy what God has said. And if you don't like what that pastor is telling you, find another one. It's really, it's really appalling. Okay. Yeah, really what else? Okay. Well, Sue says, churches and religious organizations are tax exempt. Yet Jesus clearly said, render unto Caesar. Just because something is allowed, does it make it right? Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says you've got to give money to the government. The, the Bible says you give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Well, the government has very graciously said uh, you can deduct 50 percent of your income uh, if, uh, for gifts to the church and for religious organizations because the religious organizations do a lot of work for Caesar that is very, very helpful. And to foster religious belief among the people is a great thing. You look back to see Cyrus, and he exempted people. They, he said, look, all this money is yours. You don't have to pay any taxes. You are free from taxes. Um, so this isn't something the Bible says you've got to pay taxes. You render to Caesar what Caesar's. Well, Caesar says, I want so much. But uh, he isn't entitled to all of it, and I think he's asked for a whole lot more than we want to give him uh, in, in today's world. All right. Okay, Marlene says, we have the freedom from religion People and the American Civil Liberties Union continually fighting against Christians in all areas of our lives. Do they ever fight against any other religions because they find their actions offensive, such as praying in the streets? Are we the only target? Uh, I think that's very perceptive. The truth is they understand Christianity is where the power is. It, the power doesn't exist in Islam. The power doesn't exist in Baha'i or some of these fringe religions. They don't fight against them. They do anything they want to. Uh, but they fight against Christianity because Christianity touches the souls of people. And the devil regards Christianity as a threat. Of course it is a threat because we're going to overturn him and his kingdom. So um, you're very perceptive in saying that. Anything else? Yeah, Jesus said the world will hate you, right? That's right. Yeah, so, That's right. And they do. Okay, well, Faith, uh, her name is Faith. She says, I am a biology chemistry double major who wants to work in the area of research in autoimmunity in grad school. I know in the scientific community it is frowned upon to even mention creation or God. But that is how I view the world. I want to glorify God in my work and be a witness to my fellow grad students, as well as all those that God places around me. How can I be a better Christian in a scientific world of unbelief? Uh, listen, uh, many, many uh, distinguished scientists believe in God. Some of the most distinguished of, of all of history have been fervent believers. Uh, at Regent University, we uh, are putting in a program uh, a course study and a degree called cosmogony, which is the origin of the cosmos. And we are teaching the actual scientific facts. Scientists are good at finding out the facts. Science are not necessarily good in drawing conclusions from those facts that lead to uh, 
the origin of God because it doesn't show. I mean, you don't have, but right now, distinguished men of science, men and women of science, uh, have come closer and closer and closer to faith. So, uh, if you want a course, you can get one probably online at Regent University if you'd like something more to help you. Cosmo cosmogony, the origin of the cosmos. Okay. All right, Karen writes, Dear Pat, my university textbook in religion states, no texts before the Hellenistic period claim that Satan is a fallen angel or that he attempts or that he tempts humans or causes to sin. And the fact is that this story is found outside the Bible. According to the author, Satan is the district attorney for the divine court. His role is to find people who have sinned and bring the evidence to God, who then decides on a proper sentence. I've always heard Satan was beautiful and was the anointed cherub. Where do we get this information? Well, the information is, again, mistaught. You go to the, you no know, Bible, it's right in the middle of Genesis. Satan was there to tempt uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it goes all the way through. Satan rose up against the people of God. The day of David, he numbered the people because Satan rose up against them. Uh, Satan has always been in the Bible, and yes, he was known as Lucifer, the life one. You can read <clears throat> Isaiah, you can read uh, uh, Ezekiel, you can see references all the way through the Old Testament. So. Whoever teacher you've got, they're wrong, okay? All right. Now, Michelle writes in, since God created everything and God knows us completely and knows all things, does God already know when we will use our free will in the future, even when we use free will for bad things? Uh, that's a question that people have been wrestling with for the longest time. Um, is God's free, is our free will versus God's foreknowledge? God knows the answer from the beginning. If, if you did a movie and you strung the movie all the way out, each frame looks like it's in sequence, but it's all laid out. So God sees the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what's going to happen, but he doesn't necessarily intervene. How that works, how that foreknowledge works with our free will, I don't think theologians have come up with the answer, and I don't have the answer, but that's the way it is. So just take it and, uh, and live with it, because I don't know what the actual conclusion of it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, amazing questions today and, and excellent, very good. excellent answers as always. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Romans 4. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. I appreciate from our dear co-hostess, Wendy, for being, you'll be with us all week. All week long, yeah. Good. And tomorrow Excited. we'll have an exclusive interview with Donald Trump. We hope we get some newsworthy statements from him. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, you don't want to miss it. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.